I was saying last time we talked about the sources of rights and where to find them. We demonstrated the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights and the website and how to access some of these things and how to access the general comments. We also reflected on the normative criterion of the right to food and the right to housing. Today we are starting with the right to water and then proceed to other rights. What we have on the screen now is GC for general comment number 15 of 2002, explaining articles 11 and 12. Okay, and my initial question is when we say general comment number 15, we are saying general comment of which treaty body? And when I show articles 11 and 12, I'm asking articles of which treaty or which convention? Did you understand my question? Andrew, you there? Andrew. <laughs> Andrew. I'm having some problem with my network. Okay. So, uh, I rephrase the question. Uh -huh. Okay, I will list it the question. We have general comment number 15 of 2002 that we presume is going to be explaining mm -hmm. articles 11 and 12. My question is, this general comment number 15 on the right to water is a general comment of which treaty body? And these articles 11 and 12 are articles of which treaty or convention? I'm not speaking Greek, am I? Fausti? Yes. Am I speaking Greek? Uh, no. <laughs> yes, tell me, my dear. I did not attend last, last, the, la the last lecture, so... But the, the last lecture is on the platform. These days, we don't have excuses of I did not attend the last lecture. When you miss the lecture, you go and listen to the recording. Sasa. Nitaenda kusikiza. Kukuna network. Iyo mchezo. Airtel. Iyo mchezo, dada. Kukuna chini. Andrew, give it a guess. Zaitua yuko apo? Um, it's um, the general comment for the United Nations. United Nations has so many entities and agencies and everything. Last week, we talked about the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, and it led us to general comments, and these general comments come from specific treaty bodies. Did anyone attend yesterday's webinar? Hmm? Boshere, you attended yesterday's webinar? Hmm? Faustin, did you attend yesterday's webinar? No. Yeah, there was an optional webinar I had asked people to attend. If no one attended, then it might be difficult to explain this based on yesterday's webinar. But last week, those of you who were with us last week, we talked of general comments. Where do the general comments come from? Who generates general comments? Switch on your microphones, all of you. We need to interact. Where do the general comments come from? Andrew, you responded to a question last week. You know where the general comments come from. Andrew? Zaitwa, you are with us last week. What do you remember? Sinyamanze, we need to talk over these things because if I start rolling and I just talk, I presume to Kopamoja and we are not together. 
So let me try to hear something from you so that we get on the same page. Who generates the general comments? Which entities, which entities give us general comments? <coughs> oh my God. So the right to water is enshrined in the core international human rights instrument, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, uh, on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, this right to water would also be found to be implicit in Article 11, is implicitly protected in Article 11. The right to water clearly falls within the category of guarantees essential for securing an adequate standard of living, particularly since it is one of the most fundamental conditions for survival. Closely related to other covenant rights, you would find that water is necessary in the production of food, the right to adequate food. You would find water necessary to ensure environmental is the right to health. You would find that water is essential for securing livelihoods the right to gain a living by work, and enjoying certain cultural practices right to take part in your life. So if you have a community which is dependent on, uh, if there is a community which is dependent on water for its cultural enjoyment, you would realize that uh, water would be a relevant uh, right to the enjoyment of their cultural life. The first criterion in, with regard to the right to water is availability. And in this, we talk of the water supply for each person must be sufficient and continuous for personal and domestic use. These uses ordinarily include drinking water, water for personal sanitation, the washing of clothes, the preparation of food, personal and household hygiene. That is what availability of sufficient water would mean, sufficient and continuous. Now the quantity of water available for each person has been demarcated by WHO guidelines, which posits that on average you could have 15 liters per capita. Per capita is per head, 15 liters per head in periods of peace and seven liters per head in periods of emergency. Now, some of you are social workers, others are development studies students. You would realize that in any given situation, if you moved to the rural household or even amongst the urban poor, you would find that a household of five is surviving on a mutungi of 20 liters or two for a whole day. Those people are water insufficient. 
because if you have five people, on average, you would need at least 15 liters per person per day. And yet it is also the case that many of us here are living in households where we are using more than we need. When you get to the toilet, every flushing could send down anything between 10 and 15 liters. And if you're often in that toilet, there's a possibility that you alone and your toilet visits could consume the water of a single household in the informal settlements or in the rural environment. So for purposes of the common good, those who are doing human rights and the common good, personal introspection on how we use what is available and how we prepare people to be conservative in the use of these common resources becomes relevant. Yes, you have a right to access water, you have a right to use water, but you ought to use it in a manner consistent with the common good. If you are going to be running your shamba upstream, your use of the water upstream has to be keeping in mind the common good and of those who live in the riparian part of your farm. So some individuals and groups may also require additional water due to health, climate, and work conditions. For sure, a mother in this household of four or five when there is a nursing mother, then the water needs of that house are more than the water needs of a household that might not have a nursing mother. Therefore, availability means that water supply for each person must be sufficient and continuous for personal and domestic use. The quality of water required for each personal and domestic use must be safe, and therefore it must be free from microorganisms, free from chemical substances, and radiological hazards that constitute a threat to a person's health. <clears throat> Water should also be of acceptable color, of acceptable odor, and taste. Each personal, for whether it is for personal or domestic use. People from the arid and semi arid areas will tell you that some water sources are really uh, looking funny, you know, the color of the water, the smell of the water, and yet sometimes we even have to use it along with the animals. We've also heard that in urban centers, that sometimes when the sewage pipes contaminate the water pipes and you get a kind of water in through your coming through the taps that is not safe or of poor quality and sometimes even dangerous. Now there's this question of radiological hazards, the dumping of radiological substances in garbage. <laughs> Uh, centers or collection centers which have the effect of contaminating underground water. If that water gets drilled and supplied to people, that water would be contaminated with radiological hazards and would be unsafe. Very few neighborhoods invest in testing the water that comes to them the presumption is that whoever brings the water is bringing safe water. Now, water should also be accessible. And accessibility with regard to the right water includes physical access, economic access, and access to information. We start with accessibility that is physical. Water and adequate water facilities and services in this country that the committee will be investigating must be within safe physical reach for all sections of the population. Now, average water use for drinking, cooking, and personal hygiene, as we said, would be 15 liters per person per day. 
the maximum distance from home to the nearest water point should not exceed 500 meters. But between you and me, you know there are people walking for hours and hours to fetch water. Now, a brisk walk of an adult is usually 10 minutes, 10 minutes, or 11 minutes, or 12 minutes per kilometer. So if someone has to walk an hour, it means that water is at least five kilometers away. And if they have to do a round trip, then that means two hours of walking, that's 10 kilometers to bring water home. So it so happens that uh, a number of our people are living in situation where water is not physically accessible. When the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is the relevant treaty body from which General Comment Number 15 of 2002 is generated, this General Comment that explains Article 11 and 12 of the Convenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, if that treaty body, that is the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, is to evaluate Kenya for its performance with regard to the right to water, having looked at availability, having looked at accessibility, it will examine accessibility first and foremost on physical grounds and establish whether the people in this country have physical access to the water. What is the average distance that people walk to get the water? People in urban centers seem to have water brought by pipes into their homesteads. We have to examine then those who have challenges of physical access to water to be able to improve the human rights condition with regard to water. Accessibility, as I said earlier, is also economic. We are saying that water and water facilities and services must be affordable to all. Water feedability is typically measured by the annual cost of water bills as a percentage of the median household income. Now, this is a mathematical statistical phrase. Median, okay? Median, you arrange, you arrange the cost of water per household from the highest to the lowest or from the lowest to the highest and then you establish what the median is not the mean yes these are all measures of central convergence median and average but uh, the mean uh, median and mean the challenge with the mean is that if you have some fellows who are spending too much on water and others spending too little on the water the measure of central tendency would shift towards those who are spending too much. So you would get a misplacement of the thinking that many people are spending a lot of water, I mean of money on water. So we use the median because when you arrange them from the highest to the lowest or the lowest to the highest, and you skive off two on each end, you would be able to see the bulk of people and how much they are actually spending by way of central tendency. So we are saying that water affordability is typically measured by the annual cost of water bills as a percentage of median household income. Households paying an amount of water that exceeds an affordability threshold are considered to be paying a water at an unaffordable price or they're carrying a high burden of the water costs. And just last we did housing, we indicated that you would check the cost being spent on water as a comparison to other rights. If that cost compromises or forces people to cut down on food or to cut down on housing or to cut down on other rights, then that right is not economically accessible. Then with 
access again, there is a principle of non-discrimination. So when we talk about accessibility to water, under the right water, we also affirm the principle of non-discrimination in the sense that water and water facilities and services must be accessible to all, including the most vulnerable or marginalized sections of the population. And this non-discrimination should be both in law and in fact. It is not enough that the law says thou shall not discriminate. It should also be in fact that in practice, people are not being discriminated against. And the discrimination, the, the grounds uh, against which you cannot discriminate are contained in Article 27, so Article 27.4 of the Constitution has the grounds against which, or the prohibited grounds against which you cannot uh, discriminate. Gender, race, ethnicity, pregnancy, sex, all these things are listed in there for that purpose. There are some water points that become so scarce that only the mighty are able to get the water. There are times when cartels become the reason you can access water. And that principle of non-discrimination would have been violated with regard to access. Again, with regard to the normative criterion on accessibility in water, we talk of accessibility to information. Now, remember we had access in housing, we had access in food, but access in food means something different from access in housing. Access in housing means something different to access from access in, um, in water. And we have seen that access in water means physical access, means economic access, means no discrimination, and means access to information. Now, accessibility includes the right to see, the right to receive, and to impart information concerning water issues. The understanding of the water question, as you are aware, within a rights-based approach to development, within a rights-based approach to social work, we know that we have duty bearers and we have rights holders. Rights holders participate in decision-making and the duty bearers are meant to be accountable to rights holders. For rights holders to participate effectively, they must have access to information. So with regard to water, people must have access to information. The rate of or the cost of buying a mutuity is determined by the tariffs established by the municipality or the county government or whatever. Now, if the rights holders do not have access to this information, then they can be very easily exploited. And their access would be undermined. So access to water is also largely determined is also largely determined by access to information. Now, citizens and residents are at a disadvantage when they do not know about their rights, when they do not know about the available resources for getting access to basic services, and when infrastructure plans of their village are not known neighborhoods or cities or organizations that could help provide the services they need. If they don't know them and where to find them, then the right to water is a mirage. So within the context of a rights-based approach to our service delivery, a rights-based approach to our ministry and our jobs and our programming, it is necessary that with regard to access to water, access to information becomes a very important component. We then move into sanitation. Usually they are taken to, to
together the right to water and sanitation. I chose to split them deliberately because they are distinctive. Water is what we bring into the household and it would seem that sanitation relates to that what we excrete and send out. So sanitation is a system of collection, transportation, treatment, and disposal or reuse of human excreta and the associated hygiene. Now, when you check the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, when you check the Covenant on Economic Social Cultural Rights or every other covenant that would be related, you don't see sanitation as a right. So the right to water and sanitation has become a substantive right recently. I'll be explaining later when we are dealing with special rapporteurs, the work that was done by, uh, was it Katharina Alpakuk, the special rapporteur on the right to water, who helped us coin, coin the proper language for, for the right to water and sanitation so that the UN then adopted it as a substantive right. In many of the conventions, water was popping up as part of an adequate standard of living or part of housing, you know, but never substantively as a right on its own that could be measurable uh, by the relevant treaty body, which is the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So just as I've indicated, the recognition Yeah, just as I have indicated, the recognition of the right to water and sanitation as a substantive right took place at the General Assembly in 2010 in that September session. The committee, which is the relevant treaty body, and by treaty body, I mean the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. There are several other treaty bodies. Those who attended yesterday's webinar, you know we talked about the treaty body on the rights of the child, Committee on the Rights to Child. With regard to these rights that we are dealing with, the selected rights to which you have all been assigned, the relevant treaty body is the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Now, this committee holds that sanitation requires full recognition by states parties, meaning party states that have ratified the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. The full recognition by states parties in compliance with the human rights principles related to non-discrimination, gender equality, participation, and accountability. Now, availability of sanitation essentially means, now we are going back to the normative criterion of sanitation, okay? If it is right water and sanitation, you'd have to be juggling it with the availability of water and then availability of sanitation. A bit of water and availability of sanitation. Now, when we assigned you the rights, you realize there are people who are assigned the housing and they are required to do sanitation, water and sanitation. And the rest of you, whether you're doing education, whether you're doing uh, food, you are all required to do also uh, housing. So that is the kind of trade-off that we've been able to do to make sure that each of you at least is an expert in one or two of the rights that we are dealing with. Now, there must be sufficient number of sanitation facilities with associated services within all in the immediate vicinity of each household. The immediate vicinity of health services, in the immediate vicinity of educational institutions, in the immediate vicinity of public institution, and in the immediate vicinity of places like marketplaces and work places. That's what we mean by availability. These situations of having to walk a kilometer before you find somewhere to ease yourself is inconsistent with the provision of sanitation services. 
So there must be a sufficient number of sanitation facilities to ensure that waiting times are not unreasonably long. And in schools, we usually use the ratio of 20 doors for, uh, for boys and 25 doors for girls. What does this mean? If I came into your school and I asked you how many boys are in this school, 100 boys. How many girls? 100 girls. Okay, those are 200 students in the school. I would expect that when I go to the toilet section of your school, I'll find that the girls have at least five doors. And probably the girls, I mean, the girls have at least five doors, and the boys' four doors would suffice. And the understanding is this, that if the bell for break time rang for a health break, and everyone ran to the toilet, we would be sure that each door would at least serve uh, 20 girls and each door would at least serve 25 boys if everyone were to use those services. But it is the case that you go to many of our schools in the rural areas or even in the urban centers here, and you find that uh, you have uh, three doors to a population of 100 kids or so, and uh, one of the doors is for the staff members, you know, and it has to wait for a key and things like that, okay? So availability of sanitation has to be thought of in those terms. When you're planning, when you're in the community meetings and something is coming up in the community, let's know the numbers of the people available who is likely to use them so that the availability of sanitation is guaranteed. The quality of sanitation. Now, the normative criterion on quality of sanitation posits that sanitation facilities must be hygienically, okay, someone is saying something in the chat room. Let me attend to them. Is it the case that you can't hear me right now? 9.39, that must have been a few minutes ago. When did you lose me? I tried to chat up people earlier, see if people can hear me. And I had allowed people to switch on their mic so they can tell me the challenges they are facing. But people are not talking. Hillary, you hear me or not? I hear you. But you had said you didn't hear me. What did you lose? Never say, say only. Actually, right now, myself, I've not even heard you. If you didn't hear me in the last three minutes, type in the chat room and tell me what it is you last heard. What did you last hear, Mumina? What did you last hear? Mr. Mr. Richard? Yes. Um, I couldn't hear you since I joined the chat, but I can now hear you. I was following by reading um, the text on the screen. Okay. When did you join? Do you remember what time you joined the chat room? Um, a little bit after the class started, I was downloading the, the Zoom app since I'm not using my laptop today. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so you joined 10 minutes late also. Yeah, I just got the Zoom app. I'm not on my laptop today. Okay, all uh, right. Who, who did we start with? Andrew, did you lose me anywhere? I already began. Eh? I could not hear, but right now I can hear you. Andrew, you've not been hearing me since the beginning. No, when we began, I couldn't hear you, but uh, like... And you, and you didn't signal me, you didn't type in the room, oh my God. <laughs> you know, I kept checking, I kept calling people's names. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Is Faustin here? He has left the room. Okay. Yeah, I think if you don't hear, you need to type immediately into the chat room so that uh, I check because I'm using my phone for the, for the hotspot. 
So it is possible that internet could fluctuate. <clears throat> and I think it should be necessary that you keep asking questions on the WhatsApp group after the class because it would seem that many things go unexplained and you people are not giving in the time to interact when we are on Zoom. Uh, so other things might have to be clarified out there. Okay, so let's proceed now. So sanitation facilities must also be technically safe uh, to use. And this means that the superstructure is stable, meaning you don't take people to a toilet where there is one log here and a log there, and uh, your skills of balancing would be the skills of delivery of the easement processes into the pit latrine. You know, there are some very dangerous toilets uh, that we visit that can easily cause uh, injury or fatalities, actually. Then ensuring uh, safe sanitation would also require adequate hygiene, promotion, and education to encourage individuals to use toilets in a hygienic manner that respects the safety of others. <laughs> Now you realize that even in sanitation, we have the component of access. And accessibility has information, it has information, it has non-discrimination, and it has economic access. Other people would use the term affordability of sanitation services, affordability of water, affordability of housing, when essentially they mean economic access. Is this service economically accessible? <clears throat> So yes, sanitation facilities must be physically accessible for everyone within or in the immediate vicinity. And each household, health or education institution, public institutions and places, and the workplace. Now sanitation facilities should be designed in a way that enables all users to physically access them, including especially those with special access needs such as children, persons with disabilities, elderly persons, pregnant women, parents who are accompanying children, those who are chronically ill, and those who would be accompanying them. So it is something that has to be thought through when you are establishing a, a sanitation facility or you're part of the planning process for the establishment of sanitation facilities for a community, a school or institution. <laughs> The totality of the human diversity has to be thought through on, uh, on how to make these services physically accessible. So access to sanitation would have to be economically accessible, including construction, the emptying of septic tanks, the maintenance of these facilities should be within <coughs> economic reach to all the people without limiting their capacity to acquire other basic needs. If someone has to choose between ordering a septic tank to come and remove the sewage material, to choose between that and buying food, they will definitely choose to buy food. <laughs> and that means that that service is costly. Okay, water disconnections resulting from the inability to pay also impact on waterborne sanitation. So you realize the connection between economic access to water and sanitation. If water is not economically accessible, then there's a possibility that sanitation will be hampered. <clears throat> Again, in sanitation, we cook over the principle of non-discrimination. States have obligations related to sanitation in a non-discriminatory manner. They are obliged to pay special attention to groups particularly vulnerable to exclusion and discrimination 
in relation to sanitation, including people living in poverty, sanitation workers, women, children, elderly persons, people with disabilities, people affected by health conditions, refugees and IDPs, and minority groups, among others. And priority should be given to meeting the needs of these groups. And where necessary, positive measures should be adopted to redress existing discrimination, existing imbalances, mm -hmm. and to ensure access to sanitation. So you are a social worker, you are a development person, you reach in an area and you realize, yes, we have toilets here, but it seems persons with disabilities cannot access. There are some toilets built in flats. I mean, not in flats, but I mean raised pedestals, especially in the informal settlements that are established in swampy places, where if you only dug a meter, you would touch water. So the engineers in these places then construct a storied pit latrine where for you to go and deposit the solid human waste, you would have to climb a few stairs before you get there. And some of these storied toilets do not even have ramps that would cover the needs of people, of persons living with disabilities. So in the process, you end up having an increase in the number of, uh, they call them flying toilets. Those of you who have not been in the slum setup, we have the concept of flying toilets, where human beings would uh, ease themselves into polythene bags and then toss them over the window into the garbage dump, okay? As their way of dealing with sanitation. And you can see how deficient that is you know if it is not safe to access the sanitation facilities in the night that is a deficiency of access then there's accessibility with regard to sanitation that includes access to information for states have a duty to ensure that concerned individuals and communities are informed and have access to information relating to sanitation and hygiene. It is the duty of the state to provide this information and to educate people. COVID has helped us a little bit in the public health section where hand washing has been made mandatory and people have to wash their hands before they enter matatus, as they exit matatus, they have to sanitize, yes. That is the duty of the state to educate people and to make these things available mm -hmm. or to devise mechanisms of making them available and also to monitor that these services are going on. Now, full participation, including representatives of all concerned groups is important in assuring that sanitation solution would actually be responding to the actual needs of the people that are concerned. So you remember we say that in a human rights-based approach to development, in a human rights-based approach to programming, we have duty bearers and we have rights holders. Rights holders have to participate in generating the policy in the decisions that have to be made about how to meet these rights and duty bearers in doing their work have to be accountable to the rights holders. That's the essence of a rights-based approach to what we do. Then there's the challenge of acceptability as a normative criterion of the right to sanitation. Sanitation facilities and services must be culturally acceptable. Personal sanitation is still a highly sensitive issue across various regions and cultures and offering perspectives about which sanitation solutions are acceptable must be taken into account 
regarding the design, regarding the positioning, and the conditions for use of sanitation. In many cultures, to be acceptable, construction of, so of toilets will need to ensure privacy. What would be the state obligation, as is the case with many other rights? The obligations are to respect, to protect, and fulfill. How does a state respect a right? By not interfering with it. How does a state protect a right? By not allowing anyone else to interfere with that right. And how does a state fulfill? A state fulfills a right by taking positive measures to make sure the obligations of that right are met. Now, with regard to access to water and sanitation, the states have a duty to respect their citizens' access to water and sanitation. How do they respect this? By ensuring that all government activities, including government-funded activities, do not harm water points. This is particularly important in times of armed conflicts. The state is at war in Somalia, the state is at war in Marsabit or Mararal, wherever, and they are chasing down cattle rustlers or whatever. And then in the process, they are damaging all the water dams and releasing the water to go or bombarding the tanks or blocking the flow of rivers. Now that would be a failure to respect the right to water. The discussions going on between Moranga and Nairobi, Moranga being the source of the water and Nairobi being the beneficiary of the water whose water tower is placed in Moranga. The government cannot initiate any project that might have the effect of undermining the access to water of Nairobi. How would the state then protect the right to water and sanitation? The state should protect the citizens' access to water and sanitation by protecting access to water from abuse and overuse by other actors such as farmers or private companies. I hope you're familiar with the case of Solai Dam and that right now the Kenya Human Rights Commission, Kenya, Kenya National Commission on Human Rights initiated a case against is the, so the owners of Solai Dam and the government for purposes of uh, uh, justiciability of this state obligation to protect uh, the citizens' access to water and the sanitation. Finally, the state would have to fulfill the right to water of its citizens by contributing to improving access to water and sanitation for everyone, including the poorest and most vulnerable. So the positive states respect, don't tamper with the right, don't inhibit the right. To protect, don't allow anyone to tamper or inhibit the right. Fulfill, take positive steps to fulfill. The paramount duty bearer in human rights is the state. That is the overarching duty bearer in human rights. Who is the overarching duty bearer in human rights? The state. <clears throat> then there are misconceptions with regard to the right to water and the need to clarify them. The right to water does not necessarily entitle people to free water. Water and sanitation services need to be affordable to all, not that they ought to be free. People are expected to contribute financially or otherwise to the extent that they can do so. Now, some of you are doing this course and it is being called human rights and the common good. The understanding is the state has to make sure that in its allocation of resources, it is able to make water 
economically accessible to the poorest. Okay. When you go to the informal settlements, you discover that people pay for the water. Okay, I see something in the chat room. Joseph Musao says we can't hear. Is there anyone else who hears me always facing a similar challenge? Ilaru Nanskia. Joseph, you need to work on your end. As soon as I have one person who hears me, then chances are the problem is on your end. Let me see, Joseph, how did you enter the room? Let me check it out. Joseph, aha, uh -huh. one of the reasons Joseph is having a challenge, he has his video on. Joseph, you might have to exit. How do I communicate to you now? If you don't hear me, then it might be difficult for me to say what I have to say to you. But uh, let me see. Is anyone on, in touch with Joseph? Hmm. Is there anyone in touch with Joseph? Let me see if I can do a message to him from here. A private chat message. Please exit the webinar, the meeting, and return with audio. I hope he gets to hear that. I think he can read that. Okay, so let's proceed. Joseph, you can exit. I'll let you back in. It's 10 hours. Okay, so now, does the right to water allow for unlimited use of water? Not necessarily the right to water entitles everyone to sufficient water, not unlimited use. And the sufficiency of the water is for this sufficiency of water is looked at in terms of sufficient for personal and domestic use. Okay. Then uh, does, uh, does the right to water entitle everyone to a household connection? Not necessarily. Water and sanitation facilities are only expected to be within all in the immediate vicinity of the household. And they can comprise facilities such as wells and peat latrines. Accessibility is core, immediate vicinity. It would seem that for the purposes of the state, moving closer, water closer to the people is all that the state has to do. And if the state can show that we have water points here and there, usually this service is left in the hands of local authorities. Those of you doing development studies, you will also do local government and social services. Does the right to water entitle people to water resources in other countries? For sure, people cannot claim water from other countries. However, international customary law on transboundary water courses stipulates that such water courses should be shared in an equitable and reasonable manner with priority given to vital human needs. Okay, so uh, if Uganda wants to establish a huge luxury dam, okay, Already it has a lake there, Lake Victoria, but we have River Nile. And then Uganda decides that we are going to establish a huge luxury uh, lake along River Nile. 
and it involves blocking the flow of water to the Sudan and to Egypt. Now that would be undermining uh, the, the equitable use of the water course. That if Uganda were to use the water for something necessary to guarantee vital human needs, then that would be considered that would be considered a that would be considered a use of water that is equitable. A country is in violation of the right to water if not all its people have to access water and sanitation. The right to water and sanitation requires that a state The right to water and sanitation requires that a state takes steps to the maximum of available resources to progressively realize these rights to water. What this does is to accept to a certain extent that not all states can make these services available. So they use the term, the progressive attainment of the rights. We move into the right to health. I'm asking a question again. We have the right to highest attainable. Another message in the chat room. We Yeah. Switch on your microphone. And then he has exited. Okay, he sent in a comment and then exited. I don't know what we will do now. He's no longer in the meeting. I don't know how to communicate to him. Okay, so who, those of you who are assigned the right to health, are you there? Anyone on the platform that was assigned the right to health? Can anyone talk to me? Hmm. Ama, you don't hear me. We can. Yes. Who was assigned the right to health? Anyone here? None of you here was assigned the right to health? No. Huh? Oh, yeah. I'm cool. Ama, Ama, the right to health was not among the rights we assigned to people. <laughs> Where's Zango? I'm a what health of Ako Darasani. Nicole just typed yes. Hmm? Nicole just typed yes. Ah, Nicole. So, Nicole, yes. speak to us. What is the general comment applicable to the right to health? Health, I see Faith Wambui, I see Catherine. Sikamo, I see Joseph Mosau who is struggling to communicate. Then uh, I see Mugure Mbugua. I see Atieno, yes, Nicole is here. Okay, Atieno, tell us, what is the relevant general comment to the right to health? So I do not understand your question. <laughs> okay. Have you attempted the assignment? Yes. What is the assignment about? Uh, about health. What is it about? What? Yes, you were assigned the right to health, but what are you supposed to do with the right to health? Um. Yeah. 
Hmm? The first assignment was for tracing the right from all the international instruments, regional and domestic, isn't it? Yes. I hope the others are listening because what, what I'm asking Nicole is beneficial for everyone. And then the second assignment deals with what? The normative criteria, isn't it? Yes. Yes. You, you, that yes is slow. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, yes. So the second assignment is dealing with the normative uh, criterion of that right to to health or to education or to food, okay? And what are you supposed to use that normative criteria for? Anyone knows what the assignment is asking for? Did you even visit that assignment page, you people? I'm Amna Subiri, when the deadline is coming close, then you can't check it out. <laughs> My people. Someone is talking to me. We need to dialogue over this because people keep saying we didn't understand the assignment. So we need to dialogue over this. Nicole? Anyone hears me? Hilaro Nanskia? Yes, sir. Okay. If you hear me, I can presume others are hearing me. Good people, let's dialogue over this. Caroline, you want to say something? Yes, but yeah. the way I understood the question, mm. I broke it into four steps. I wrote water, mine was water and sanitation. Yes. I related to the international conventions yes. and so the regional looked, instruments. So you looked, yes. for, you looked for water and sanitation in the various international instruments? Yes. Good. And also the domestic legislation mm -hmm. and the constitution of Kenya, how it relates mm -hmm. with water and sanitation. Very good. Okay, that is one thing you did. Okay, then the yes. second assignment. By the time we finish all these assignments, each of you will be an expert in one of two of these rights. What is normative criterion in the first place? Randy, you cannot ask this question. This word normative criterion has popped up in all the classes. <laughs> has anyone looked at a general comment? I'm going to answer you, Randy, but it has to be based on this question I've just asked all of you. Has any of you looked at a general comment? Hey, Wenzang. General, mm -hmm. The general comment for, I think. Which right are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing right to food. Right to? Food. You're doing food. And you said your general comment is? Has anyone visited the Office for of health. the Commissioner for Human Rights? Yeah. This is a space where I keep taking you and we cannot not access it. We cannot not access it. It is really important that we are all familiar with it. So I've stopped slide sharing so that I may return you. Okay. What do you see now on the screen? Hilary, talk to me. You're my checkpoint now. Yes, I see some apps. You see the website with tabs, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now, this office, anyone who is doing anything about human rights, mm -hmm. 
must be familiar with this office. It is the office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. Okay? OHCHR.org. It is the Human Rights Secretariat of sorts at the United Nations. Everything human rights is found there. Everything human rights. So students of mine, I make sure they go to this site and learn how to navigate this site. Because most of the assignments and most of the things I'm talking about in the classroom setting can be found in the databases on this site. So you ought to build your own expertise on how to navigate this site. I would be delighted to be receiving questions on WhatsApp for clarification of how to access what, not for answer of simple things that can be found here. So what page am I at now? Hillary, the United me. Nations Human Rights. Okay, the United Nations Human Rights. Is that where it ends? Mm, no. Office of the High Commissioner. Yes. So it is the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. That's where we are. There are many things on this page, but the matters we are tackling can be founded with a focus in this tab on human rights bodies. I think I explained this last time, but I'll go over it again because uh, people don't interact with these things when they leave class. Then you've heard me talking often about treaty bodies. You see that? Someone whose microphone is on, you need to keep saying yes or no because I'm not seeing the chat room now. Okay. Yes. So yes, treaty bodies. You click on treaty bodies and treaty bodies are, hmm, my internet was unstable. Okay, treaty bodies are committees of experts that are established by the international human rights treaties. You see the core international human rights treaties? We okay. talked about them last Best. class. <clears throat> For every international human rights instrument, and you know there is an assignment that was asking you to peruse all these instruments, the nine of them, Forget about these optional protocols. I'm interested in these core ones, okay? Yeah. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the core, the nine core international human rights instruments. We will do those optional protocols at another level. Maybe at your master's we can pursue mm -hmm. that. But uh, you see these core international human rights instruments. The first assignment was asking you to look in each of these and find out what it says about the right you were assigned. Okay? And then move to the regional instruments, African Charter on Human and People's Rights, Protocol on Women, the Protocol, the African Charter on the Welfare of the Child. Okay? That is what you are supposed to do, including domestic legislation, the Constitution, the Acts of Parliament. Kenya Law of ORG is a good source for the Acts of Parliament. That is the first assignment. The second assignment was asking you to look for the normative criterion of each of your rights. And then use it to examine what is happening in any informal settlement of your choice. You have to go there physically. Now, we've told you that health, education, water and sanitation, uh, food, okay, and housing are dealt with I'll establish under the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. There are four. The relevant monitoring body is the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. You see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. C can mean Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, but when it is a monitoring body, it means Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. That's why we call them treaty bodies. You remember? When we reached here, we came through treaty bodies. And the treaty body that I've kept asking you, I've asked the question twice in this class, what is the relevant treaty body to food? What is the relevant treaty body to health? So someone tell me, what is the relevant treaty body to health? Nicole? Nicole? 
Nicole. Nicole. Oh my. Caroline. Yes. What is the relevant treaty body to your right? What right are you doing? Water and sanitation. You're doing water and sanitation. And what is the relevant treaty body? Mm. Just look on the screen and give me an answer, my dear. Did you see this? Can you read where the CASA is? Caroline? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, I can see. Monitoring body. Yes. Okay. These are all monitoring bodies. Yes. So what is the relevant treaty body to the right to water and sanitation? Question for the one that you have put the CASA CP. Name it, name it. Oh, international. It is? Where we have permanent, you place committee. Yes. So, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination of Racial Discrimination has a treaty body called the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women has a treaty body called the Committee on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. You see that? Okay. So the treaty relevant to water, to food, to housing is the international. The treaty relevant to food, housing, health, education, all the rights to which you've been assigned is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. There are four. The relevant treaty body is. Someone talk to me. Is my question very complicated, good people? On matters of racial discrimination, we go to the committee on, a, on elimination of racial discrimination. On matters, discrimination against women, we go to the committee on elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. Now, on matters of food, health, housing, and water, we go to what? Treaty body. Committee of International Protection Economic Infection. That is a convention. I'm asking a treaty body. I'm not sure why it is becoming very difficult. On matters of racial discrimination, the relevant instrument, the treaty, the convention is the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And the treaty body, which would monitor states, is the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination. On matters of women, the relevant treaty, the relevant convention is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And the relevant treaty body, that body that monitors the performance of states would be the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Now I am asking, and I've given you a clue, that housing, water, health, food, education, 
All the rights that have been assigned, the relevant treaty is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And I'm asking a simple question, good people. What is the relevant treaty body? Committee of Economic, Social, Culture, and Cultural Rights. Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. <laughs> Fair enough? Mm. Yes. It's taken us quite a distance. Now, when you go to the page of this committee on economic, social, and cultural rights, okay? When you go to the page of that committee, you would find very many things that the committee does. Very many things even the protocols of the committee, the rules of procedure, working method, all those things. But on this page, I'm inviting you to go straight to what we call the general comments. Someone asked what is normative criterion? For the treaty body, Hilary, Hilary, are you there? Yes, sir. For, I'm there. This, for this treaty body to be able to monitor how Kenya is performing on any of these rights, it has to establish standards. It has to establish what it will look out for. Okay? What are the norms to be met with regard to food? What are the norms to be met with regard to health? Are we together? So that is the normative criterion or criteria that will be used to examine whether a given state party to the Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights is meeting its obligations to respect, to protect, and to fulfill a given right. Hilary Tukopamoja? Okay. So now, that normative criterion those standards are usually established in the general comments. Okay, so when I was asking you to go to the general comments, this is where I was sending you to check. Okay, when you peruse, these are up to 25 of them, the most recent being in 2020. Okay, when you peruse these general comments, you will find a general comment specific your right. Let me increase the page size to 50 so that we, all of them are there. Okay? And for each of these, you can view the document. You can even download it in Word. You see that? You see, I've just been talking about water. The stuff I've talked about water can be found here. The people of food, the stuff can be found there. Okay, education has several general comments. It's not only primary education, there are several other general comments. What were health? You know, general comment? Okay, when I asked you to look at the general comment, that's what I meant. You were supposed to just follow that path and look for the general comment relevant to your right. Understand the normative criteria. Each of these general comments has a normative criterion. So all the things I've been talking about, availability, access, quality, all these things, each of these is contained in the relevant general comment. Kuna muta kuna sali hapo? Kuna swali? Okay, Nicole, are you there? Yes. What is the general comment relevant to health? Okay, you will go check on it. I'll not give it to you. What is the general comment relevant to health? <laughs> the 
clue is on the screen, good people. Right to the highest standard of health. What is the general comment relevant to the right to health? Meaning if someone ah, yes, on health, eh? if someone working on health is to go to that page, what general comment would they be looking for? Player, you want to say something? Hillary. Yes, sir. Okay, let's proceed now. Yeah. You know, I've placed the clue on the I've placed the clue on the screen deliberately because the general comment GC, general comment is number 14 and it is helping us explain article 12. Now, when you go to article 12, article 12 of which treaty? What is the relevant treaty to health? Which convention is relevant for health? Kiboy. Yes. What is the relevant convention to health? The economic, social, and cultural. Oh, the, the economic, social, and cultural rights convention. In full, it it is what document? Say it in full, please. You're right. Okay. What the is convent, the, the what convention? Is the convention. Oh, sorry. Covenant. The con the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. Yes. So when we say Article 12, we are talking of Article 12 of the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So you must know the right, you must know the treaty from which it is pronounced, and then immediately you will know the relevant treaty body. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so. Anyway, so we move on. The first normative criterion on health is uh, there must be functioning in that jurisdiction of the state party, there must be functioning health and healthcare facilities. So if the treaty is to examine whether Kenya is fulfilling its obligations, it will, the treaty will be looking out for whether there are functioning public health and healthcare facilities. Remember the word is public health and healthcare facilities. It not, it's not just any healthcare facilities, public health and healthcare facilities would be examining whether they are functioning goods and services as well as programs and whether they are available in sufficient quantity within the jurisdiction of this state party. Now, the committees are aware of the different developmental levels of our countries. So the precise nature of the facilities, goods and services would vary depending on several factors that might include the developmental level of each country. Availability also includes the underlying determinants of health, such as safe and portable drinking water, adequate sanitation facilities, hospitals, and other health centers and related buildings. 
there must be trained medical and professional personnel receiving domestically competitive salaries and essential drugs. When you have medical practitioners and medical professionals who are underpaid, that undermines availability with regard to health. Then we move into accessibility. And as I told you, accessibility means something different in water. It means something different in housing, means something different in food, means something different in health. So accessibility here, we are starting off with the concept of non-discrimination in accessibility. Health facilities, goods and services must be accessible to all, especially the most vulnerable or marginalized sections of the population. In law and in fact, without discrimination, any of the prohibited grounds. So you are interacting with your people in these households and you're asking those questions necessary to establish whether or not they feel discriminated against when they reach the hospitals, whether the hospitals are welcoming to them or discriminating against them on any of the prohibited grounds as mentioned in Article 27 of the Katiba. Then accessibility also includes physical access. So the health facilities, goods and services must be within safe physical reach for all sections of the population especially the vulnerable or marginalized groups, such as ethnic minorities, indigenous populations, women, children, adolescents, older persons, persons with disabilities, and persons living with HIV and AIDS. Physical access. How far is the nearest hospital? How good is the road that leads to these places? and mothers having to deliver on the way just because of the bumpy roads that they have to endure. In physical access, it also implies that medical services and underlying determinants of health, such as safe and portable water, adequate sanitation facilities are within safe physical reach, including in rural areas. Now, you remember the principle of immutability and the interdependence of rights? Any of you who has worked with a CBO will know that when a CBO sets out to deal with the question of food, they will end up in health. Or if they start off with health, they end up in food. Many people started off with educating orphans have ended up into services of health because they have to deal with the sick parents. Okay, so that interdependence, so you realize how Water is a key influencer in the section of health. Sanitation is a key influencer in the section of health. And the interdependence and immutability of rights is a key component of a rights-based thinker. Accessibility also includes adequate access to buildings for persons with disability. Then economic access that other people call affordability. Health facilities, goods, and services must be affordable for all. Payments for healthcare services, as well as services related to the underlying determinants of health, has to be based on the principle of equity, ensuring that these services, whether privately or publicly provided, are affordable for all, including socially disadvantaged groups. Equity demands that poorer households should not be disproportionately burdened with health expenses as compared to richer households. Accessibility, as we said, included physical access. It includes non-discrimination. It includes economic access. Now it also includes information. Accessibility includes the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas concerning health issues. However, accessibility of information should not impair the right to have personal health data treated with confidentiality.
Then the criterion of acceptability. So we had availability, we had access, we had availability, we had, uh, we had access with all its components, now we have acceptability. All health facilities, goods and services must be respectful of medical ethics and culturally appropriate. That is to say respectful of the culture of individuals, minorities, peoples and communities, sensitive to gender and lifestyle requirements, as well as being designed to respect confidentiality and improve the health status of those concerned. As you can see, the assignment requires you to be able to interview these households and sort of pass a judgment, ask, encourage them to judge for themselves whether they find the health facilities accessible, they find them available or acceptable. And remember, we are talking of public health facilities. Don't tell me that you are in Rongai and because there is Nairobi women, there is whatever, there are four health facilities as accessible. No, you need to be asking where is the nearest public health hospital. And is that public health hospital available, accessible, and acceptable? And the things we are talking about are the ingredients of that accessibility. Then the criterion of quality. As well as being culturally acceptable, health facilities, goods and services must also be scientifically and medically appropriate and of good quality. This requires, amongst others, skilled medical personnel, scientifically approved and unexpired drugs and hospital equipment, safe and portable water, and adequate access. Now, even sometimes the remuneration and conditions of work of the health workers guarantee quality of services. Someone was telling me recently that in Kisumu, when a woman goes to hospital to deliver and she's anywhere above 28 or 30 and above, the nurses generally mock her and they're asking her where she was to be delivering a child this late. Just because the practice has been that many girls are having children earlier, some as teens, others in their 20s. So women who would have gone to hospital to deliver, who are older, are not too old actually, they are 30, women of childbearing age, feel stigmatized just because they've had children late. And I really wonder, on one side, we are fighting teen pregnancies. On the other side, we have health professionals that are unwelcoming to those having children late. And it is a very amusing thing, surprising. Okay, education. Who is doing education on the platform now? I am. Um... Okay. What is the relevant general comment? The clue is on the screen. <laughs> okay. So, education. Criterion number one is availability and we would have that in this state party to the Covenant on Economic Social Cultural Rights, there should be functioning educational institutions and programs 
which are in sufficient quantity within its jurisdiction. It's a question of availability. Do we have schools, bare minimum? Do the schools exist? Are the schools enough? Okay, that is the bare minimum. And the schools you're talking of are public schools. You don't cite private schools in these senses because as we said earlier, the ultimate duty bearer in the area of rights is the state. The ultimate duty bearer in the area of human rights is the state. The next criterion is acceptability. So the form and the substance of education, including curricula and teaching methods, have to be acceptable. Acceptability means they are relevant, they are culturally appropriate, and of good quality. To the students, and in appropriate cases, parents, one would imagine that the kids of a pastoralist should be prepared education-wise to be the best ranchers that have ever existed. One would hope that the children of a fisherman should be prepared to be the best fisheries officers ever existed. That the child of carpenter should be prepared to become the best carpenter ever existed. That is relevance, culturally appropriate and of good quality, competitive, meaning the, 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 the kind of learning people are receiving is competitive on the global scale. Of course, this is subject to the education objectives that Article 13 of the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights defines, and such minimum education standards as may be approved by the state. Now, for me, I'm a little bit impressed by the competency-based curriculum. The only problem is that it designs one jacket fit all, but it would seem that the competence-based curriculum, if it had been contextualized, the kind of competence-based learnings necessary for a kid in Turkana or a kid in Maralal are different from the learning competencies necessary for a kid in Nyeri, a kid in Mombasa. Because of their contexts, there are certain competences that would be necessary uh, to have them excel. But the competence-based curriculum is for sure a good attempt to move in the direction of acceptability of... Okay, Sandra Anasema. Mm. No, this is Saru. Uh, so, da so does what UNICEF offer as sexual education beat the normative criterion? <laughs> Thank you for the question. That you have to ask that question to the cultures. Actually, I saw the Muslim statement that is responding to Susan Kihika's reproductive health care bill. And uh, she was saying, uh, the Muslims are saying, you cannot just talk of age appropriate education. It must also be faith accepted. So yes, uh, Kiboy, that is the question about what UNICEF is doing. That's the question about whoever is pushing comprehensive sexual education. Those are the real questions. Are they accepted? They are being offered as good, but are they acceptable? And whoever is challenging the acceptability, do they have reasons to indicate why they are not acceptable? So thank you for raising that question, Saru. Comprehensive sexuality education, as offered by UNICEF, UNFPA, IPAS, IPPF, WHO, and all these entities, UNESCO also, are they considered acceptable? That kind of education being offered to the children. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So again, uh, such as minimum education standards as may be approved by the state. Now, the promoters of comprehensive sexual education for sure know that it is the duty of the state to establish the minimum education standards, okay? And the learning objectives. So these big players, UNICEF, UNESCO put together and UNFPA, will move into our ministries of education, our ministries of gender, our planning departments, our health departments, and influence policy and they influence curricula, and they influence, you get the point. And in the process then, 
they would be able to influence what the state determines as minimum educational standards. Now, that changes when you have parents, when you have civilians who have their own objective standards or maybe subjective standards based on faith, based on culture, based on Africanness, they then begin to question whether the government policy is actually acceptable in this matter. When I was reading through the Muslim statement, I was also impressed. They are condemning the adolescent reproductive health care policy of 2015. He said this policy is already preparing the state to push comprehensive sexuality education. So it has to be revised and revisited for further uh, consultation. And the consultation and engagement of the citizens then would make it acceptable. Then if an educational approach is adopted, that would be acceptable. Okay. So Kiboy, thank you for raising that question. It contextualizes our learning. The next criterion is adaptability. Education has to be flexible so it can adapt to the needs of changing societies. Okay, education has to be flexible so that it can adapt to the needs of changing societies and communities and respond to the needs of students within their diverse social and cultural settings. Adapt to the needs of the changing societies and communities and respond to the needs of the students within their diverse social and cultural settings. There is no reason why young people from Mombasa do not turn out the best marine officers or marine scientists. There is no reason why the fishermen on Lake Victoria and their folk do not turn out the best fisheries officers. Is the education we are offering people adaptable to our changing needs and societies. Accessibility is another criterion. And as usual, accessibility is split. So we begin with physical access to education. Education has to be within safe physical reach, including by attendance at some reasonably convenient geographic location, accessed by persons with disability. Now look here, good people, COVID has challenged us. I know there are kids right now who are still in school. I know there are kids who are still interacting with their teachers on Google Classroom. These I'm talking of primary school kids. But for sure there are many kids who this does not make sense. So that physical access to education might mean that in situations such as this, the one tablet per child policy ought to have been operational long time ago. For us to talk of physical access to education. But one tablet per child would not suffice if it is largely web dependent, because that then would also mean that you must have infrastructure relating to increased internet connection. Now, right, some, right now, we have a class of around three, but I've never had more than 15 of you in class. It means that people having a physical challenge access. They cannot technically access uh, education services. Okay, so that's a challenge of access if one is to say. And uh, so when we say that the state is fulfilling its obligation to make education accessible, we will be asking, is it constructing schools close to the people? If it is digital learning, do we have internet access? Okay, that would be physical access as a criteria. We then have economic access. Now the basic principle is that education has to be uh, affordable to all. The global community has been enforcing free primary education. Others call it universal primary education at primary level. 
And then at secondary level, there is a push for progressive realization of free secondary education. While at a higher education, when you look at the relevant articles, those of you are doing education, you will see the Committee on Economic, Social and Culture, yes, the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights says different things about primary education, about secondary education, and about tertiary and higher education. One is free and compulsory. The other is to be progressively become free and compulsory, while the third is only accessible according to capacity. Then the concept of non-discrimination within the accessibility criterion. Education must be accessible to all, especially the most vulnerable groups in law and in fact. In law and in fact means it is not enough to have it on the law that the education in this country shall be non-discriminatory. It must also be the fact that it is non-discrimination. And again, the non-discrimination is based on the prohibited ground. I kept referring to Article 27 of the Constitution. That's where the list of prohibited grounds is. The grounds upon which you cannot discriminate are contained in Article 27 of the Constitution of Kenya as promulgated in 2010. Then let's focus a little bit on primary education. Primary education is defined as ensuring that the best learning needs of children are satisfied. Essential learning tools such as literacy, oral expression, numeracy, and problem solving. Literacy, a child can read and write. Oral expression, the child, the child can express themselves orally, or if by sign language they can express themselves. Then numeracy, basic numeracy, counting, adding, subtraction, division, multiplication and problem solving, critical thinking, okay? And the basic learning content, such as knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes. That is what has to be in primary education. Meaning even if you didn't take your child to school, if these can be attained in a home setting, your child is receiving primary education. So learning tools and basic learning content required by human beings to be able to survive, to develop their full capacities, to live and work in dignity, to participate fully in development, to improve the quality of their lives, to make informed decisions and to continue learning. So primary education is about preparing you for the world and to be a continuous learner. And what the rights, the covenant insists is that it shall be compulsory and free. Everyone should have primary education and it should be free for all, <clears throat> okay? So with regard to primary education, you see the distinction here. We have some mechanisms before the competence-based curriculum came, you know that, and I suspect most of you on the call right now went through that kind of memorialization, eh? memory, memory learning, okay? We load the stuff in your head and uh, we expect you to reproduce it. You realize that you even face a challenge when it gets to university education, 
and the kind of assignments we are giving you are assignments for you to go and find for yourself and learn as you find. You would rather I said everything, you memorized it, wrote down notes, I give you an exam and you give it to me back. It's quite a challenge that we need to change, okay? Now, that kind of education has been criticized by Paulo Freire. It is called the banking approach, okay? But the real approach has to be the problem solving approach. So I send you to the human rights instruments, go find your right, go find what is said. Now, if you just go and plagiarize and copy and paste, well, that's, that's up to you in the terms of learning. But when you go and look out the stuff yourself, you learn because you'll be solving a problem. You'll be discovering what these instruments say about your right. Okay. Then you will go out into the field and try to examine first the normative criterion. Again, you find the normative criterion in the general comment. Read it and understand it. Don't just rely on the slides I've just talked about. And then you go and apply the normative criterion in the real life context of the people that we ought to be serving when we graduate as social workers or when we graduate as development students. So you go and literally examine the situation in which they are and you use the normative criterion to describe the human rights condition of the people you will have interacted with. No, these people here have access because of X, Y, Z. No, these people who don't have access. These people have physical access. No, they don't have. There is discrimination in this area because of evidence X, Y, Z. Now, that is the description that I would be expecting from you. Then we upgrade to secondary education and see. Now, secondary school education is defined as including completion of basic education and consolidation of the foundations for lifelong learning and human development. You complete basic education and consolidate foundations of lifelong learning. If the learning you had at secondary education is not preparing you to learn at university, it's 11 hours. they cheated you. Your parents were cheated and their fees and your time was cheated. So you need to be catching up now to develop that lifelong, lifelong learning component. How do you find knowledge? Where to find knowledge? How do you do research? That is what you're doing at university and preparing students for vocational and higher educational opportunities. Now, secondary school may be provided in its different forms, thereby recognizing that secondary education demands, yeah, secondary education demands a flexible curricula. It demands a varied delivery system that would respond to the needs of students in different social and cultural settings. And while we made primary education compulsory and free for all, the requirement on the state is that secondary school education shall be made generally available and accessible to all by every appropriate means, and in particular by the progressive introduction of free education. So states are expected to progressively introduce free secondary education. Now, secondary education is not dependent on a student's apparent capacity or ability. And secondly, that secondary education will be distributed through the state in such a way that it is available on the same basis for all. State parties should not adopt varied and in, should adopt varied and innovative approaches to the delivery of secondary education in different social and cultural contexts. I hope you people understand this. Because what we have coming out of the curriculum for secondary education is one court fits all. Everyone in every corner of this country is expected to learn the same thing and do the same exams. 
regardless of how relevant that learning would be uh, to the people wherever they are. We then talk a little bit about TVET. Now, technical and vocational education forms part of the right to education and the right to work in Article 6.2 of the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And it is defined as all forms and levels of the educational process involving, in addition to general knowledge, the study of technologies and related sciences and the acquisition of practical skills. The acquisition of practical skills the know-how, attitudes, and understanding relating to occupations in the various sectors of economic and social life. Attitudes and understanding relating to occupations in the various sectors of economic and social life. Then higher education should also be available in different forms. It shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity. Okay, now, second education is to be progressively made available. Free primary education is universally available to everyone. Higher education, where you are, you as university students, shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity. If someone has capacity capable of handling university education, then they should be able to access. No one who has capacity for university education should be denied an opportunity to access. The government would be then failing in its uh, duty to protect and fulfill the rights. Now the capacity of individuals should be assessed by reference to all their relevant expertise and experience, not just this exam. You get the point. I interacted with some young people in the year 2018. Very vibrant, the youth groups that I was working with across the country. Very vibrant leaders. I'm so and so, I'm in this school, I'm heading to university when I finish form four, ba 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 ba. Then KCSE results come back and the poor girl has a D plus or a D play. And it, she's just so demotivated, the very bright, fellow leadership oriented, very innovative that I saw in August 2018 is not the fellow I saw in February 2019. Why? Because the results came back and because she got a D plus in that exam, she felt she was worthless. The same with all the young men from Mombasa, from Nakuru, from Bongoma. This exam cannot be the only basis of measuring capacity. But for some reason, our education system has chosen to say that the exam is the measure of capacity. And states have an obligation to take concrete steps towards achieving free higher education. The South African students have been very vigilant in pushing for free higher education. They say fees must fall. Okay, they don't want to remove the fees completely, but they're actually pushing uh, that the cost of, of education in higher level should drop. Okay. Okay. Now, within the context of social, economic, and cultural rights, we have the right to life, but I think we need to close here for now. We'll do this when we are dealing with the uh, We'll do this when we are dealing with the, when we are, when we are dealing with the conflict of rights. So I'm willing to take a few questions now, if there are any. If not, we, we can end our class here. We've been working for the last two hours. I think that's good enough for now. Yes, thank you, sir, for your class. I feel it enjoyable. I have a question about the assignments. Yes. 
there is two assignments that you gave as a group. The exam, this submission was on 27th. Hello? And it's PowerPoint. You're flying, you're flying. Repeat your question, please. My concern is about the assignments. Mm. You say it's one, the one that you assigned about the rights, housing, education, and food, and whatever. Yes. So is it individual or group work? Because it is individual, but no one prevents you from working with the people who've been assigned the same right. You can enrich each other. It must do it as a part of group work. Eh? Yes. Hello? Hello, sir. It is individual, but no one prevents you from working with others assigned a similar right. Okay. Yeah, no. And if between yourselves you agree for one person to do the presentation, I have no problem. And with effect from next class, we are going to be listening to people's presentation. Hello? Also, you asked, you told us to scanning my, plat my platform. Yes, sir. Yes? You promised to send some notes, previous class record. The recording for last class is on the platform already. Uh, maybe the problem is my. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who has yes. access to the recording? Yes. Okay, so the recording is there. Okay, now that there's no other question, shall we plan to meet next week? You know, this semester is a very brief one, but uh, the classes for me have been able to compress the content. So I think we are going to have uh, three more classes at most. So you need to be in finishing mode. We started late, but the content is doable. You need to raise questions on the platform that are learning questions, not only logistical questions. People only ask logistical questions. After all, this thing does not work. After all, the other one doesn't work. You know, I don't want complaining questions. I want questions for clarity, and I want questions that add value to the learning process. So, Tuonane, next week.